election. This is a by-election. We all know that by-elections are very different than general elections. I mean, really, they're not even the same animal. They, we often A 30% turnout in a by-election is a lot of turnout. And we also know that by-elections you know, tend to be challenging for the government that has a, minor, a majority because people know it doesn't matter how they vote, they're not going to change the government in power. That's Joan Crockett. She won the big prize in Calgary Centre last night. But was the victory overshadowed by an apparent drop in support for the Conservative Party in that riding? Are by-elections, quote, different animals, as Crockett put it? Did a split on the right in Alberta make the race tighter than expected? Or did the Liberal and Green parties make real political gains in support? And is the strong showing of the Green Party in both Calgary Centre and Victoria proof of potential growth? Lots of questions there, so let's dig into the by-election results with the Power Panel. Tonight, we have a new addition to the panel. We want to welcome Elise Mills, a political analyst and communications strategist in Thank Vancouver. You. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm looking forward to tonight. Okay, well, we're going to get into it. And in Montreal, Marty Patrickin of McLean's. He's... <laughs> <laughs> In the studio, Rob Silver. He's already starting. He's feisty tonight, Crestview Strategies, and we have uh, Ian Capstick of Media Style. I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. Now, Rob, I'm going to warn you already to behave. <laughs> now, I'm going to start with our newest member, uh, Elise. Which party came out with the biggest victory last night? Which came out with the biggest, and which one came out with the biggest losses? This is going to hurt me to say this, Hannah, but I think it's the Greens. I, I think that uh, for them to be the type of party that was really really well known for hyping themselves right up and then you know absolutely sort of falling apart in the 11th hour this is a big push for them um, you know Victoria I, I think we all sort of expected it to go NDP you know easy breezy lemon squeezy but it wasn't they gave their NDP uh, rivals a race for their money and uh, and showing up in Calgary they way, the way they did was an absolute stunner so I think the winner of the night are the Greens um, and I think they should be taking a look at what they learned from the two by-elections last night and and put a plan together and move forward because they're going to give the NDP a run for their money. Biggest loss? Biggest loss, Elise? Oh, biggest loss? Yeah. I would have to say that it would be the NDP. Um, to see the results in Calgary was absolutely uh, stunning for me. I never thought that the Greens would surpass the NDP. I mm. mean, I know that it's not going to be a left-leaning riding. Let's face it, it does have a red Tory history, but, you know, to bring out an NDP vote so low, that was a stunner. Uh, to see the Greens flip over the NDP like that. But uh, I think also they have to take a look at their numbers out in... Um, uh, in other areas out in British Columbia as well. I think that's sort of the next focus. They can learn a lot from Calgary. They definitely can build off of Victoria. They've got some ridings that are very similar to those two, and they could build from that. Okay, Ian, I want to bring you in on this one. Yeah. In Victoria, it was a close race there. And in Calgary Centre, as Elise was just saying, the NDP, 3.8% of the vote. Were they sending a message to Tom Mulcair? Well, and let's, let's we forget Durham. Let's not forget the third race where they came in se second, second to the Conservatives. Yep. Um, a, quite a strong second, I should say. 26.3% uh, of the vote so there. So I think the most interesting thing for, for me at this point in taking a look at where the New Democrats ended up in the riding of Victoria is, is this isn't actually much far off the mark of where Denise Savoie used to win this seat back in 2004 in the 2006 election. So Denise Savoie put that mark at above that 50% mark mm -hmm. because she was an extremely popular member of parliament, former city councillor, and lest we say that the, ca the candidate there was not as well known as Denise was. And one step further than that, the Green Party has two distinct advantages working for them during by-elections, three actually. One is the concentration of effort. You can get every Green member of um, your party all across the country to be phoning into some strategic ridings and some strategic areas. Two, you've got a concentration of money, funds available for you to be able to do extremely well. Now, Elise, our, our new panelist, has been extremely critical of some organizational funding of the Greens on her Twitter account. Should fo folks should go take a look at that. Surprised she didn't bring that up when she was saying they did so well. Um, and then third, um, I think that there's no strategic voting at play. Uh, you can't suggest that you're going to either elect or unelect a government, so thus voting for a party like the Green Party, or quite frankly like the New Democrats many years ago, becomes a much easier position. The New Democrats know this well. We used to win a lot of by-elections the same way the, new uh, the Greens are going about it right now. The question is, is it transferable into a general? Um, Look, the big winner last night was the status quo. Uh, everybody who had a riding going into the by-election held the by-election, so we're going to fill a panel uh, dissecting it. Uh, but at the end of the day, as of tomorrow or the next day, uh, it didn't matter that 
much. Uh, two, if you aggregate all three by-elections together in terms of total vote or percentage of vote, uh, two parties' votes went up. The Green Party vote obviously went way up because compared to the general election, and, and I agree with Elise. Big winners. Uh, arguing anything otherwise uh, is foolish. Liberal vote went up by just under 15% in all three ridings aggregated. Uh, NDP uh, vote went down by about the same as the Liberals uh, went up. The Conservatives went down uh, by about 30%. I'd love to draw some master conclusion. Stephen Harper better resign before Christmas because he's in big trouble. But it's just <laughs> not the case. It's a by-election. Uh, tomorrow's another day. Uh, muzzle tub to the three new MPs. I'm not sure it really matters that much. Marty, just a by-election? Uh, you know, the thing that's, that amused me through a lot of this has been the sort of narrative of, dec of decline that people said uh, about Miss Crockett, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, she lost however many, 20, 20 points off, off Lee Richardson. Mm -hmm. I actually think this is a sort of a, a re-emergence uh, re of the conservative brand. You have Lee Richardson that was there before, you know, talk about red Tories. He was a red Tory. Joan Crockett is as close to a paleoconservative as this country has. She wandered around her riding with, with uh, Rob Anders, you know, probably the most socially conservative person uh, uh, in the in the party, in the Conservative Party, she eschewed the 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 the, the, the Nenshi debates. She, uh, you know, didn't pay attention to a lot of the media, and yet she still run ran, run in this in this riding that is supposed to be sort of this reemergence of the, the new face of the of, uh, of of Calgary. You know, it's not it's not old school or anything, and and yet she still won. Uh, and the, the other thing too is that you know the rage at the status quo that everybody was talking about before. We're talking twenty six percent turnout. Like, if where is just, the rage? If I can just jump in, Hannah, sure. for a second. I think Rob's going to like this comment. This one's for you, Rob. If we take a look at the voter turnout and then you look at, uh, uh, say, somewhere like the Victoria by-election last night, yes, the Greens were able to mobilize, but what if this was a federal election? This, what if this was a general election? Would their mobilization actually work? And I actually disagree with Ian. Murray Rankin is a top-level five-star candidate for the NDP. I mean, he's as good as gold. Everybody here knows who Murray Rankin is. And so, you know, you have to sort of, I think the NDP really need to question their strategy. If you can't win on like a you know a clear uh, by election, sorry, uh, wait a minute. Did you say you, you can't win? They actually did win. No, and no, like no, I no. said, why don't you address the fact that in the 2004 and then the 2006 elections, you're basically hitting around the 35 percent mark, which is what Marie Rankin brought in. So I'm sorry. Like I understand what you're saying, but the real story here is is how did the Greens increase their vote by 20 percent? Alisa, why don't you tell us your theories on uh, the funding in that particular race? <laughs> okay, wait a minute. I'm going to ask. The, I'm going to ask the questions here. I know you would love to. But, but, there's, but, but, but I, 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 think, I think, I think, I think, I think Ian did Apparently hit. Ian's hosting the show tonight. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, Rob. He's, do, he's doing a bang-up job of it. Um, yeah, but Ian hit on a big point, and, and this used to be a strength of the NDP before the NDP's uh, breakthrough under Jack Layton, which is when there was only one election or two or three elections, you could put everybody in those elections, and they used to do very well, disproportionately well, in by-elections. The question for Elizabeth May is, can she transform this in a general election context? The other thing is, there's been some lazy analysis in Calgary in particular about the green vote. Uh, that, that if only the Greens had gone liberal, strategic voting, that things might have been differently. Urban Green votes are taking votes from the Conservatives yeah. as much as they are from the left. Uh, and I think people need to get a bit more of a sophisticated of analysis of where the green votes actually come from, urban versus uh, rural ridings. And Marty, just quickly before we go to the break, I want to get your opinion on what Rob's saying here. Well, I, I, I think, again, and I, I come back to it, the, the, the fallacy of, of uh, strategic voting, not only what, to what Rob was saying, but I don't think, I honestly don't think that uh, if we hadn't had, you know, everybody made a big deal about what McGuinty said and what Trudeau said. I don't, honestly don't think, if you take away that out of the equation, if neither Mr. Trudeau nor Mr. McGuinty opened their yaps during the campaign and created those, uh, those uh, unforced errors, I don't think that would have been enough to cover the vote split anyway. So I think, uh, as Rob said before, I think it's pretty much status quo. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. We have lots more to talk about with our power panel. Elise Mills, Martin, Marty Patrickwin, Ian Capstick, and Rob Silver are going to stay here. I want you guys to stay right there. Back now with Power Panel, Elise Mills, Marty Patroquin, Ian Capstick, and Rob Silver. Now, uh, we saw Rob Ford's apology today. I'm going to come to you, Rob, <laughs> who's usually in Toronto. Uh, what do you read into this apology today? Uh, a little bit weird. I mean, yesterday he was attacking the judge for being, and the, the whole process for being a left-wing conspiracy. Today he's very contrite and sorry. Um, 
this is, taking this away from Rob Ford and trying to elevate it to a larger policy uh, issue. This is about minimum uh, mandatory minimums, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, the judge, once he found him guilty, everybody's saying, well, you know, it was 3200 bucks for a, a football team. This seems so disproportionate. Tough luck. The little kid who gets busted with some pot plants in his closet, if he cries and says he's sorry, it doesn't matter. If you have a mandatory minimum, the judge has no discretion. And it's delicious seeing conservatives now whine and complain about how unfair this is. This is so tough on Rob Ford. Guess what? Of course it is. Change the law. But you should also change all of your anti-crime legislation that have mandatory minimums for nonviolent offenses built into it, i.e. the entire Harper crime agenda. Let's just remind the audience what he had to say today. Take a listen. To everyone who believes I should have done this differently, I sincerely apologize. The people elected me to bring respect for the taxpayers back to City Hall. I will keep working to do exactly that for as long as I can, or until the people elect someone else to do the job. Ian, do you think this is admission that he handled himself wrong yesterday? Yep, pretty much. Um, not only that he, he handled himself wrong yesterday, but he handled himself wrong on every opportunity when he was given a chance to make things right with regards to the actions that he took on behalf of his own personal charity. And then one step further, what he was actually convicted of, which was voting on his very own disciplinary measures related to that particular um, inappropriate activity. So, I mean, you know, um, you know, Rob Creek, uh, Rob Ford is, is up a creek without a paddle here. I mean, the bottom line is, is that he's got the two weeks left that the judge has given him to place the appeal. He may or may not get a stay of his removal from office. And then he cannot, according to the Toronto City uh, uh, Solicitor, run in the next by-election. So in essence, he has to do this today if he'd like to come back at this in 2014 to reclaim his name. Now, I should add here that the only real historical precedent we have for this is William Horlack in Edmonton in like the turn of the century. And lo and behold, Holy what smoke. happened, wow. four years after he was booted from office, not allowed to run again, he got reelected. So let's just say that there are, the citizenry of our nation has reelected people who've done bad, bad things before. Just look at Bev Oda in Durham. Okay, Elise, I want to come to you. What do you think of what Rob had to say earlier? Do you feel that the punishment for Rob Ford fits the offense? Well, I, I, you know, Rob's going to be surprised by this, but we're going to go two for two here, um, and I'll throw this one to Rob. I'm not a conservative that is complaining about this today. I'm a law and order conservative, so, you know, uh, you do the you do the crime, you do the time. But I do think there's a couple of issues, and we need to separate it out on a strictly communications, political communications level. This is refreshing for me to see Rob's uh, the the mayor so contrite. I do think part of the problem with Rob uh, Rob Ford is that any good that he he does sort of gets out shadowed or outweighed by the, the way he sort of delivers the good news, if I can say it. 100%. Um, yeah. Yep. yeah yep. Let's, let, so there's that first part, and I think we're all in the business of communications to some degree and, and helping campaigns out, and so I think all of us would, would have given this advice to Mayor Ford a long time ago, and shame on the people that work for him for allowing that to continue. But second of all, um, I think, uh, you know, when we do a comparison, it's not Joe Fontana from London. This is, and it, mm -hmm. the judge made this very uh, point um, themselves, was that this is not an allegation of corruption. This is actually um, an issue of uh, inappropriate use of letterhead city uh, taxpayers' dollars because it went on city letterhead, the request for donation. But let's keep in mind, you know, I know it's great to sort of pile on Rob Ford, but let's keep in mind what this was really all about. It was about raising money for a football league. No, this, is it, this not was Joe about Fontana. Rob Ford being in conflict of interest. I'm sorry, this was in oh, Rob Ian, Ford being Lord. directly within conflict of his own interest. He, in essence, sat on that stand and said that he had not read the conflict of interest guide. How do you not read the rule book for your I, own job? Ian, I'm not disagreeing coach. with you. Uh, Ian, Ian, I have to say this. It wasn't I'm not about the ma ma I want to get Marty in here too, guys. Marty, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, look, just to put this in perspective for our lovely viewers, a couple weeks ago I sat through a day of testimony at the Charbonneau Commission 
whereby one city official, a guy named Gilles Suprana, listed off something in the order of 60 to 63 contracts that were forged from the beginning and had uh, extras implanted in them to make people in the Union Montreal, the Mafia, and city employees richer to the tune of, to, I think that day he made $1.2 million. City contracts in Montreal have been 33% higher in the last four years than anywhere else in the country. And despite all of that, the, the mayor of Montreal stayed on the entire time. So if there's anything I can take from this, it's to suggest that maybe the, the, the rules governing this sort of thing in Montreal are loose, but they are very, very way too constrictive. They're as uh, loose here as they are constrictive in, in, uh, in Toronto. Right. And, I, and I, don't, I honestly do not think that a man raising $3,200, regardless of what I think of him personally, for charity, exactly. deserves to, to, what happens to him. This is not two, personal. Two, two, two points. First off, as Ian said... Uh, it's not about raising the money. It's the fact it's that he voted when he was found in conflict. You cannot yeah, vote. You cannot vote. So, so and that's stupid. On, uh, uh, but I agree sure, with your... Sure, I, sure. Okay, first, first off, it's not stupid. It's not you stupid. need conflict of interest regulations. <laughs> no, what is stupid, stupid for what doing is stu it. What is stupid? <laughs> so it was Rob stupid of him Ford to do it. Stupid, not <laughs> uh, so it was okay. stupid of Rob Ford to do it because he either knew or should have known that he was not allowed to do it. Second... The current law, I would argue, is stupid for not giving any discretion for judges to have a different penalty from removal of office. But it's so, very so should, exactly. should, should he have had a fine no, or okay. a slap on the wrist? Agreed. But the, the, the third point is, um, to the kid, again, going back to my analogy, to the kid who was caught with the pot plant under the conservative mandatory minimums, you could say, but he didn't kill anybody. Look, the guy in the courtroom across the hall just shot a man. Is this really so bad? And the point is, of course not. That's why mandatory minimums and lack of judicial discretion is bad laws and should be eliminated. Okay, now Olivia Chow is being asked if she'll take a run at the mayorship should the job come open. Take a listen to her response to reporters today. I don't speculate what the courts would do. Uh, as soon as the court made a decision and city council uh, deliberate, deliberate uh, what what, what options is in front of them, then uh, I'll consider what role I might play. It's definitely not a no, Ian. Am Definitely I right? Definitely not a no. And a 45-day campaign most certainly favors a candidate like Olivia Chow, who's used to the compact campaigning that ha is um, federal races, right? Um, not to mention, it doesn't take too many resources to mount a 45-day campaign. I'll, I'll put it this way. I'd move to Toronto to, uh, to support Olivia Chow for mayor. Okay, I want to move on to another topic. You heard topic. it here Just... first, folks. Uh, there you <laughs> go. Ian, Ian's moving to Toronto. <laughs> He's not hosting the show. Okay, the Board of Internal Economy was looking at former Bloc Québécois leader Gilles Duceppe's <clears throat> use of parliamentary resources to pay for a political staffer. The board found he was wrong to do so, but can't do anything about it as there are loopholes in the bylaws that allow it. Here's what government whip Gordon O'Connor had to say about the finding. The appropriate thing would be to Mr. Giuseppe to consider, and perhaps the Bloc Wilder, to consider repaying some of these funds, maybe all of these funds, because even though they are following the letter of the law, they're not following the spirit. Marty, I don't have a lot of time mm -hmm. left. What do you think of this? Uh, I, I think it's the one thing that's been interesting for me to watch today has been the split between the English and the, the English and the French media. The French media is saying that Mr. Duceppe basically got off the English media saying that he's guilty. And that sort of gets to the heart of the, of the, of the decision here. Uh, it's basically saying that he did something inappropriate but our rules are not appropriate, therefore we can't, we can't, uh, we can't uh, fault them for anything. So it's a very, very sort of mysterious kind of ruling around. We need to remove Duceppe from office. It's the only possible uh, uh, and, remedy yeah, and, here. And, and, that's, and that's the other thing. I think it actually, I think it actually is it's good for Duceppe because if, if, if he, that leak hadn't happened, that he'd be leader of the PQ right now and nobody wants to be leader of the PQ right now. Okay, a very spirited power panel today. I want to thank Elise Mill, our newest member of the power panel, Marty Patrick and Ian Capsick and Rob Silver for joining. Thanks, thanks. Appreciate your Thank time, you guys. Thank you so much. Thanks. Now a reminder about our ballot box question. Did the punishment fit the crime in the Rob Ford case? Let us know what you think. Go to the ballot box section of our Facebook page or cbcnews.ca or scan that QR code. It's at the bottom of your screen. You'll go instantly to our ballot box. And if you have comments on anything you hear on the show, be a part of the conversation on your screen, all the ways you can get